In the course of these films, I have focused on the basic structure of the ball game. This involves the ensemble standing in a circle while numbers of balls pass in random patterns among them. If there's a small number of balls, only one or two, there is plenty of space in the exercise and the individual performer comes face to face with her tendency to distract herself, to lose attention. If there are a large number of balls, and what constitutes a large number really depends on the familiarity of the ensemble with each other and with the exercise, then each performer has to find how to carve out a way of calmly engaging with the exercise when, potentially, she is overloaded with impulses, each requiring response. In between these two poles, of having too little to do or having too much to do, this training takes place. There are a number of variants of this basic pattern that I use during the training. All offer the ensemble different experiences, but all are based on the same principles. All offer the same opportunities for modelling and metaphor, and all involve the same encounter with the mechanics of the self as are to be found in the basic pattern. The point of varying the basic circle pattern is not primarily to learn new things, but to allow the ensemble to experience the same learning in slightly different contexts. At the heart of the ball game, always, is the requirement that the ball be caught and thrown without blockage, that it flows, that impulse moves inevitably to reaction. Occasionally on the films you might have noticed that the bags are being passed in pairs of the same colour or pattern. Catching and throwing pairs requires independent but coordinated use of the two sides of the body. It allows a performer to see whether she is using an equal effort with her left and right side, for if she is not, the pair will not fly together across the space. This kind of objective reflection by the ball on the instructions it has been given allows the performer to see what she is actually doing rather than relying on what she thinks or feels she is doing. Also, you have seen choreographies being added to the basic structure of the exercise. These might include asking the performer to jump while catching so that her feet are off the floor at the moment her hand connects with the ball. It might involve her clapping before each catch and or spinning, touching the floor, jumping after each throw. It might involve her lifting the foot opposite to the hand she's catching with from the floor at the moment she catches or perhaps jumping when the person next to her catches the bag. Each of these choreographies require the performer consciously to sequence her thoughts and, once she has done that, to allow that sequence of thinking to become an embodied set of actions. As such, we are rehearsing the process of embodiment. Introducing the voice into the exercise employs a different set of thinking functions and allows the performer to encounter a different set of distractions. Simply making a sound at the precise moment of catching integrates sounding with physical action. Asking that the group harmonise together while catching and throwing, without allowing their interaction with any individual ball to disrupt the smoothness of their sounding, requires both intense listening and an ability to keep vocalising constant while physical actions are perhaps jagged and sudden. To introduce speech is particularly interesting. It's very revealing to experience the difference in engaging with the reality of the ball game, based as it is absolutely in the moment. While trying to describe in detail a dimly remembered landscape from one's youth, or holding a genuine conversation with someone across the circle, it requires a coordination of two quite distinct areas of the brain. It is not only interesting for a performer to experience so clearly the complex workings of herself, it also allows her to rehearse working with memory or recollection while remaining absolutely alive to the ebb and flow of impulse in the moment. It is also useful to work the exercise in pairs. In this example, the performers are asked to jump, touch the floor, then spin after each throw. The result is that by the time they have finished their choreography, the ball has almost returned to them. They emerge from their spin and must immediately see and catch a ball that's only a couple of feet away and travelling fast. 
This exercise demands high levels of hand-eye coordination and reactivity. As soon as a performer blocks her reaction to the ball through fear, self-doubt, annoyance at the quality of the throw she's responding to, she will not be able to complete her catch. The journey from impulse to reaction will have been interrupted. This version of the exercise also illustrates how being helpful, which here would usually take the form of doing long, slow, high throws to your partner that she would have plenty of time to respond to, being helpful deprives your partner of having a full experience of the exercise. In trying to be helpful, one simply destroys the intention of the work. An enhanced version of this pair's work is to use a pair of bags, so that on emerging from her spin, the performer needs to respond to two impulses, both in an instant. It's challenging and utterly joyous. A further development of the exercise involves the ensemble walking in random patterns through the space. They're always looking for the empty space or the space that will be empty by the time they reach it. Thus, two sorts of flow are happening simultaneously, flow of the ensemble round and through the room and flow of the bag between members of the ensemble. There are innumerable variants of this walking version of the game, including one where if someone is responsible for a ball being dropped, either by failing to catch it or by doing an uncatchable throw, then they must proudly claim their failure, thus transforming the game to something like a clown training exercise. A further development might see people claiming the drop, but everyone having to fall to the floor and stand up again whenever the ball hits the floor, or without interrupting the ongoing flow of the ball or balls. There are endless variations. The exercise can be adapted to fulfill a wide range of functions, to offer a wide range of experiences, to model a wide range of ways of thinking, to explore a wide range of expressive styles. However, at heart it remains always the same exercise. It is about a quantum of communication passing from one performer to another. In receiving and passing that quantum of communication, charting the journey from impulse to reaction, the performer encounters herself. She views that encounter through a set of simple but rigorous principles which offer her healthy ways of reflecting on herself and developing. Each member of the ensemble working through those principles within the exercise enables each other member of the ensemble to have their own experience of the exercise. We learn by enabling others to learn. In developing the self with others, we become ensemble.